thank you for coming. Um, so I think the chat is disabled right now, um, so we can um, use it. So if you would like to tell me what brought you to this class, I would love to hear um, that from you. So if you want to just jot it down, um, you know, what brought you here while I start sharing my story. Um, so I am, my whole well, journey to plant-based nutrition started about probably eight years ago, maybe seven and a, half, and a half years ago when I found a lump in my breast. And um, as a young mother, I had a one and a three-year-old at the time. I got scared, went to the doctors um, and everything that they told me, it really made me feel like um, I was just a number, just next, next. Um, I, I was really frightened. I was looking for answers. There was nothing that they could give me. And um, I remember going to different um, doctors to see, you know, different opinions. And again, there was nothing that they could give me. One doctor said, well, if I knew the answer of why you have the slump or what's happening to you, I would get a Nobel Prize. So um, that to me felt very sarcastic and that's not what I needed to hear. Um, and then I learned a little bit, you know, I jumped online, got, went to the library, got a bunch of books. And um, I learned that if this was to be cancer, breast cancer, there's only three alternatives that we can do, which is surgery, radiation, and um, uh, chemotherapy. And that none of those options seemed like a good option for me. So the doctor said, well, if you're not going to listen to anything I have to say, why are you here? And that was a really aha moment for me. And I was like, that's a really good question. So I never went back and just went to the library, got all the books that I can think of. My nightstand, my nightstand was full of books and I just read anything that I could on the topic. And I canceled all my appointments and everything that I read, um, all the doctors that I researched and everything kind of went this way to a plant-based nutrition. And I said, well, um, I'm not going to wait around for a diagnosis. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start a plant-based way of eating for myself, for my family. I, I talked to my husband about it. He was on board, at least at home. Um, so uh, that's how I started into this journey. And everything that I learned, which are going to be some of the things that I'm going to share with you, um, to me were just like these huge secrets that nobody was really talking about. And I just wanted, I'm a teacher. Um, and I just wanted to share that with anybody that would listen. So I said, well, if I just start talking, people are going to say I'm crazy. Like, you know, she goes, she, here she comes with a crazy way of thinking. So I said, let me go and try to get some certifications, you know, something under my belt that would really educate me more. So that's why I went to get the Cornell certification and I became a Food for Life instructor so that I can share this information with all of you. So I'm glad you're here. So I have somebody to share it with. Um, just a big disclaimer, I am not a doctor. I am just a teacher that, you know, learned all this information and I wanted to become an instructor so that I can share this information uh, legally with everybody else who wanted to listen. But everything that you will hear today, please feel free, you know, go talk to your doctor, don't change any medications and that kind of stuff based on what I'm saying. Make sure you do your homework correctly, okay? All right. Later, I'm listening to something right now. Oh. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my presentation with you guys and let's see, uh, let me know if you see it. Okay. Does it look okay? Um, on your side, Caroline. Okay. All right. So, um, I told you a little bit about this. So when, when I started to really think about, you know, what is really healthy food? into my journey. If you were to ask, you know, depending on where you're coming from, no matter if you're United States or different cultures all over the world, I'm from Romania, I came from Europe. Um, so depending where you are in the world, your understanding of what is a, a healthy diet could be slightly different. Even right here in the United States, um, we think that whatever's healthy is a little bit different for, for each other. Um, and even if you were to go and ask a doctor, what is a healthy diet? If you ask different doctors, they're, go, they're all going to have different kind of um, opinions about that, what is a healthy diet. And um, if I was to ask you, you know, what is a healthy diet, probably our answers are going to be a little bit different, right? 
And these are some of the doctors um, that I said that I, I kind of um, learned from into my, in my own journey. And they are the ones that after many, many years of experience in their own field, they all kind of agree that a healthy diet is based on this fruits, grains, legumes, and vegetables. These four big different groups, uh, food groups. So I'm going to quickly give you a little bit of um, background. So we just need, in, in terms of what our body really needs, our body needs something called macronutrients. That means we need a lot of it, right? So we need protein, we need fats, which is lipids, and we need carbohydrate. Our body also needs a lot of water and it needs a lot of fiber for good digestion. We also need something called micronutrients, and that means that we just need a little bit of that, right? So that's the vitamins, the mineral, the antioxidants, and the phytochemicals. And all these are found in plant-based foods, so just plants that are tons of different colors. That's where the phytochemicals come, the antioxidants. And again, so due to clever advertisements, there's a lot of things that we think we know about nutrition, but actually that might not be true. So uh, we're going to play a little game. If I was to say protein, what would you think of? And feel free to put it in the chat. Why would it come to you if I would say protein? Carolyn, if you want to read that to me, because I'm afraid if I go to the chat, my um, screen is going to be disabled. What are people saying? Yep, you're muted. <laughs> uh, somebody said meat. <laughs> Yep. And that's exactly right. Right. So we have been sold this thing that you need protein and protein comes from meat. Right. How did we learn that? It's just advertisements. How about calcium? If I said, oh, where do you get your calcium? You would say. Milk. Milk. That's right. Dairy products. How about if I say omega three? This is just like a tiny little random thing that our body needs. What would you say now? Fish. Yeah, I can see on Susan's lips, she goes fish. That's right, right? So we would think of fish, all right? So I'm going to go um, and talk a little bit about this meat. So the, the first one, the biggest, biggest one, protein. No meat, hmm, where do we get our protein? So if we look at this beautiful animal or gorilla, it's predominantly plant-based. Where does the gorilla get? the protein because it doesn't eat meat. Where does a cow get the protein? And this tiny little picture has two, uh, uh, there's two different proteins inside. One is the cow itself, right, the meat, and then the other one is the grass. So let's look at the structure of this protein. So if you can imagine that um, we have a link, uh, kind of like a necklace, a necklace of pearls. That's how our, our structure of protein looks like. And there are all those little tiny pearls, are, they're, they're called amino acids. And that's what a protein is made of, different kinds of amino acids. Now, depending on where you are in your life, you need different amino acids that I need, that my children need, depending on what we need to have in our body grow, right? So our body, what it does, it takes this chain of amino, of, of amino acids, which is the protein itself, and it kind of breaks it all down. So when we eat a piece of steak, our body takes that whole necklace, breaks it all down into the tiny little different color pearls, and then rearrange itself into the protein that you need on that particular day at your stage of your life. So where do we get this amino acids? Where does the cow get the amino acids? It gets it from plants. Amino acids are made by plants. The cow does not make protein. The cow does not make these amino acids. The cow eats the grass that has the amino acids and then it makes its own protein. So when we eat a piece of steak, we take that whole link of protein, we break it down again, and then we make our own protein that we need. So when we eat protein that comes from animals, we're just eating recycled protein. We just need to go directly to the plants instead of going to um, animals, all right? And if we look at beautiful animals like horses, you know, all these animals are plant-based and they're nice and strong and healthy. Um, in the movie, What the Health, which is, if you have not seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. I think it's still on Netflix. Um, and I'm going to give you some resources at the end too. The Dr. Uh, Alan Goldhammer talks about that if we were to eat a diet um, you know, assuming that we all eat 2,000 calories, which is an average of what, what um, we eat, 
if you just eat white rice and broccoli all day long, nothing else, no other fruits, no meat, no nothing, you would get about 80 grams of protein. And for women, we only need about 46 grams or so, and for men, about 56 grams of protein. So even if you were just eating rice and broccoli, you are already getting enough protein. But there's a lot of commercials that will kind of makes us care, like, oh, are you getting enough protein? You're probably not getting enough protein. That's why you're exhausted or something, right? But that's not the case. Um, so do we need extra protein? No, we really don't need, especially that, the ones that comes in, like, you know, uh, protein powders and all these granola bars that we see. We don't. And this is why. The protein, when we ingest protein, our body does not assimilate it, which means we do not hold on to it. Because if we did, we all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but we don't, right? So that's because our body does not hold on to the protein. Our body gets rid of the extra protein that it has. And when that happens, it puts a lot of pressure on our liver and then on our kidneys. And that's why we get this diseases called the kings and queens diseases, like gout disease, right? Because when we have all this extra animal protein in our body, our, uh, our liver and our kidneys cannot keep up with getting rid of it because that's their job, right? To get rid of extra stuff that we have in our body that our body doesn't need. And that's when we can um, develop different kinds of diseases. So more protein can be dangerous, especially if it's uh, um, animal protein. Plant-based protein does not uh, react the same way in our body. All right. Um, and then when it comes to me, you know, even if we forget the whole protein thing to the side, there's a lot of other things that come with the meat that it's really not healthy for our body, right? So all the way the meat is being raised into this, in this country and so on, all this has extra oxygen, antibiotics, there's contamination in the way that they're, um, you know, uh, collecting and, and, and um, storing the meat and all that and carcinogens. So um, we're way better off not um, eating that. Um, so where do we get our protein then? Well, this is where we get our protein. Plants have protein. And if you just Google how much protein does this have, you'll find out um, immediately. So just we can just go directly from that. All right, let's talk about cow milk. So cow milk is meant, is made by the cow mother for the baby calf that just had. If uh, a cow did not just have a baby, then the cow does not produce milk, right? So a lot, of, of, a lot of us are thinking that, oh, the cows are just producing milk all the time. No, in order for a cow to produce milk, the cow just needed to have a baby. Um, and that means it contains a lot of extra estrogen and, and fat for, for the baby. And uh, it's a mammal, so just like the cow milk is made for baby calf, just like the human milk is made for baby humans. It has specific things that is like the perfect food for that baby. And um, it's meant to take that tiny little calf and in three months, the cow milk is going to make that tiny little calf into the adult size. That's not what we want for our tiny little babies, right? And we are the only species in the world that drinks a different species milk. And we are also the only species, humans, that are drinking milk all the way into our adulthood. All the other species, all the other animals, they drink milk for a little bit of time. And then when they wind off, they're done, right? They're, they're getting their own food. But us as adults, we have been taught to believe that we need to continue drinking that milk. And if we were, you know, I like to show this little picture to my students and I say, well, would you drink a pig's milk? Would you drink anything else like a horse milk or something else? They're like, miss, that's disgusting. That's crazy, right? But we yet, we have kind of been brainwashed to believe that a cow milk is meant for us. Again, in the movie, What the Health, uh, Dr. Greger talks about how um, the human milk has the lowest amount of protein comparing to any other animal out there, no matter what you're thinking of, right? So that's like just a couple of different examples of a rat or gorilla and all that. And that is because humans grow at the slowest rate than all the other animals grow a lot faster, so they need a lot more protein, but humans grow at the slowest rate. So we just need in the perfect uh, um, food that is made out there, which is the human milk for a baby, it's, it has this perfect protein and fat and everything um, inside 
and it only has one gram of protein for 100 calories. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then in the China study, um, Dr. Campbell talks about casein, which casein is the protein that it's found in milk. And a lot of times they take that, they dry it out, and they have it for you know bodybuilders to um, think that they want to build more muscles. And Dr. Campbell in the China study has um, seen, ha has found out is this awesome study that shows that casein, which is the protein in milk, has the power to turn on or off cancer. So they did this little studies where they had mice and they gave them liver cancer to all of them. And to some of them, they give them 20% casein and to the other one, 5% casein. So as soon as they gave them 20%, they saw that the cancer went up. As soon as they went to 5%, cancer went down. So they went up and down. So basically they know they can turn on and turn off cancer depending on how much casein, which is a protein in dairy, they gave to this rat. And uh, this is related to uh, different kind of cancers. So it's not just like one particular one. And okay, so then if we're not going to drink milk, then where do we get our calcium? And we all probably remember all these commercials with the milk mustache that we've seen on TV, right? Um, and we think that, well, we need to drink milk in order to get strong bones. In another movie that I have on the reference list for you called Forks Over Knives, um, there's a beautiful animation where it explains that the moment that we drink milk or any kind of dairy product, right? <clears throat> What happens is uh, when our body ingests that, our body becomes acidic and that's represented by those red little dots in our body. Our body becomes acidic. So then your body has to go to the closest place possible to neutralize that acidity. So it goes into the bones and it takes out calcium and other minerals to neutralize the acidity produced by the dairy that we just ingested. So basically what we're left with, the more dairy we drink, we eat because we think we're gonna need calcium, the weaker our bones get. So that was like a big aha moment for me. And then also if we look at like, all, you know, all the countries that have a lot of intake of um, calcium, uh, of um, dairy products and the United States is like one over here, you're going to see this correlation. The more dairy products, the more osteoporosis. So it's really not um, the other way around. All right, so where are we gonna get our calcium? The same place the cow gets it because the cow does not produce calcium. Calcium is a mineral that comes from the ground, right? So the cow gets it from the plants and that's where we're going to go get it, directly from the plants. Um, all right, let's talk about omega-3s. So isn't fish good for you? So we all think that fish is good for us because it has the omega-3s. And just like with uh, protein and with calcium, where does the fish get the omega-3s? They get it from seaweed, right? They don't produce it. They just eat it from the seaweed and that's how they have it. And if we're looking at uh, farm raised fish, there's a lot of bad things in there. You know, they get sick and all this. So there's a lot of things. Um, in one of the classes that I took, they were saying that if somebody saw how farm fish is being, is being uh, grown, um, they would never eat fish again. So if you need some inspiration, some motivation, look into that. <laughs> um, if we look at like a wild caught kind of fish, um, we have to keep in mind that it's um, bioaccumulative, which means that if a tiny fish contains, uh, eats something that it's not good for them and a bigger fish, it's the other fish and so on, it's going to accumulate in the bigger fish that we eat all this mercury and mercury is the biggest thing that we have to be um, aware of when in terms of eating fish mercury contamination um, and i remember being pregnant when they say like you really have to um, cut down on the amount of fish that you eat and i'm thinking like well if that's not good for me when i'm pregnant it's probably not good for me period you know um all right um are there any questions coming in so far caroline um Mostly uh, just sort of for ideas for more protein, um, which, which you kind of... Okay. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit more about it at the end. I'll make sure I leave some time for Q&A, you know. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, it's just like, um, 
we do not need to eat it, it when we think about eating this kind of food for you know like we're gonna eat the fish even though it has all these bad things just so we can get that tiny little omega threes so instead of it's doing that it's kind of like saying well i'm going to inhale smoke from tobacco because it has oxygen in it right so just to kind of give you a idea so where do we get the omega-3s again we go directly for two plants and there's some plants that have more more omega-3s than others um, but basically we just go directly to plants and if you just google anything that we're talking about right now you're going to find a lot of information and I also give you some reliable sources that you can go and um, search um, you know some of the doctors that are in these courses that I took so that you're not just reading who knows who on the internet all right, let's talk a little bit about fats. So there's some kind of healthy fats and there's some unhealthy fats. Uh, we talked a little bit about the unhealthy ones. So the ones that come from dairy, from meat, from eggs, oils, even if it's um, olive oil or coconut oil, coconut oil, no matter what kind of oil it is, oil is at the end of the day, 100% fat because all the vitamins have been taken away. So if you think about olive oil, right? So if you eat the olives, you have the fiber, you have the vitamins, the phytochemicals, everything inside, it's good. And the little fat inside the olive. But if you have the olive oil, then you remove most of the stuff that was good and you just left with the fat of the olive oil. So we consider that an unhealthy fat and it's really not good for your arteries. And I have a little video that I'm going to um, share in the resources that you can look more that explains about why not oil. Um, and the healthy fats are the nuts and seeds, avocados. Those are the healthy fats. Uh, we just have to keep in mind for weight loss um, that anything that is in high calories, so fats are high calorie, but these are good fats for us. So for children that are growing and all that, it's great. Um, but if you're somebody that is interested in weight loss, that's something to be aware of. Um, I was watching one lecture with Dr. Clapper and he explained how uh, he went and he, he was an anesthesiologist and he went to take the blood of a patient before the surgery the next day. And when he went to take the blood of a patient, um, on the right side, the one that is very, very cloudy, that's how the blood of the patient looked like. So normally, the left side is the normal blood, how it's supposed to look like. If we take somebody's blood, we see the red blood vessel going over there and then it kind of separates the serum and you see that nice clear liquid. That's how the blood is supposed to look like. But in this patient, it would look very, very cloudy. So Dr. Clapper went back and said, hey, what, what did you have before you came over here? And he was saying, well, I, I stopped at, you know, one of this um, junk um, fast food places and he had a burger and milkshake and that kind of stuff. So um, what they realized is that what they were looking at, that white cloudy stuff, it's the fat that was inside those meals that the patient just ate a couple hours before the blood was taken. And what happens is when our blood runs through our blood uh, veins and our arteries, it's supposed to kind of go kind of like water, if you can imagine, through veins, nice and easy without any problem. But the moment we adding all this fat, it becomes very um, kind of like maple syrup running through veins. So it's very, very hard. That's why a lot of times after a Thanksgiving meal that we ate a lot of turkey or something, we're feeling very sluggish. That's exactly what's happening inside our body, right? So the blood vessel go, the uh, blood is circulating very slowly. Um, and it takes about four hours or so for our blood, for our body to clean up this blood of all this fat and make it back to normal. And I'm not sure if I have, oh, I do have the slide. So, um, but if we think about it, you know, if for breakfast we have some sausage and some eggs, all of a sudden our blood becomes all maple syrupy, right? So all full of fat. And then as soon as it gets the chance to be cleaned up, it's lunchtime. And in the United States, we think it's Christmas every time we're having lunchtime. And for dinner, it's always Thanksgiving or something, right? Or the other way around. And then it's always somebody's birthday. Um, so we always have dessert. So basically, by the time our blood gets the chance to get cleaned up, every four hours, we're re-pushing that fat again, fat again, fat again. Um, so that's why, um, you know, in time we're saying like, well, I've eaten, I've, I've eaten this way my whole life. I've never had any problems. Well, disease builds up. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes years to build up. All right, how about erectile dysfunction? So 
the arteries that go from the heart to um, the rest of the bodies are really big. If we can think about, you know, uh, we can imagine like the straw, the soda straw, right? Um, the water straw, they're pretty big. But the arteries that goes um, to the, through the male penis is very, very tiny. It's kind of like the, the straws for the coffee. So the blood circulating through there has a harder time, right? Because it's very narrow um, if it's full of fat. And in, again, in, in the movie, uh, there's another documentary uh, called The Game Changers. Um, and they did a little experiment. They took three um, young um, athletes in college and they give them a different kind of burritos to eat. And we're just talking about this simple, not really scientific experiment, but just like one meal. So they all got, um, I think one of them got a plant-based, like a bean burger, the other one got a chicken burger, and the other one got like a beef burger or something like that. And um, they, um, the, the, when they did the study, they gave them some kind of machine that they, they had to wear at night that measured their um, erections, how long the erections last through the night and how many erections and how strong they are. And then, they repeated the same thing the next day, but this time everybody got a bean burger. And just by eating that one meal, their um, erection increased with 400%. So needless to say, those athletes were like, all right, next time I have a date, I know where I'm going. We're going to a vegan restaurant. We're not going to go and have no steak. Um, so that was very interesting and usually takes attention of male audiences. Um, so this was the blood after just one tiny meal. Again, with a plant-based, it was nice and clear. And with chicken, just one meal, this is how it looked like. All right. So instead of thinking about, you know, oh, how about meat? How about calcium? How about this? We really have to focus on fiber. Fiber is one thing that, our, uh, you know, as, as a nation, we don't really think about, but it's very important for our body. And um, as average, we get about 14 grams of fiber a day in, in the United States, and we need about 40. So that's what we're going to try to go to, um, to really try to think about that. And, you know, really quick on fiber. Fiber is kind of like the way I like to explain in my classes. There's two different kinds of fiber. You don't really have to remember any of that, like what kind and all that. But one of them kind of works as a gel, Right. So the moment, you know, like if we think about oatmeal or something, the moment that we eat something, um, the fiber that has, contains fiber, the fiber in through our digestive tract kind of collects everything like a gel and then gets rid of it when we go to the bathroom, right? So it cleans our digestive system nice and clear. The other kind of fiber is kind of like a broom. So it cleans out the walls of our, our um, intestines so that there's nothing growing over there and everything is clean. And um, fiber kind of works in our body kind of like a superhero. It's really important. And the way it works is, let's say I eat um, eggs and, and sausages for breakfast. So the moment I eat them, you know, our body um, takes uh, the cholesterol that is found in there and it stores into our liver. So anything that we eat before it goes into the bloodstream our, our liver kind of takes it out of the bloodstream to see like, oh, you're kind of like a bodyguard. Are you supposed to be here? You're not supposed to be here? Oh, it's too much of you. You're supposed to, I'm just going to store you. So it stores all these toxins, the cholesterol, the extra estrogen. Um, it just stores it into the gallbladder, into um, the liver, and it waits there. The next time that I eat, let's say I eat an apple later on, the moment that fiber comes into my digestive system, and as soon as there's any food, um, the liver just gets rid, the gallbladder gets rid of whatever toxins, and they're going and they're meeting the food into the digestive system, into the intestine. And if there's fiber in there, the fiber takes this cholesterol and gets rid of it. But if I didn't eat an apple and instead I'm having a donut, right, for a snack, then as soon as I eat that and that cholesterol goes into the, the digestive system, the body is going to say, well, there's no fiber, so fiber cannot get this cholesterol to get rid of it. So instead, it gets reabsorbed back into the body, back in the liver and waits there. And the liver says, hey, what are you doing here? I thought I got rid of you already, right? And it's just going to keep on circulating this over and over again unless we eat fiber. So it's very, very important. Um, one thing that my daughter likes to tell everybody when she's helping me teach a class, she likes to say that plant-based food 
have lots of fiber and they have zero cholesterol. So cholesterol only comes from animal foods. So if you're not, if you're eating a plant-based diet, you are not ingesting any cholesterol. All right. So cholesterol comes only from animals. And if you're only eating a high protein without any plant in it, uh, diet, you know, animal protein, then you're not having any fiber. So animals do not have fiber. Eggs and, and cheese and that kind of stuff have no fiber in them. That's why a lot of us have issues with constipation. Um, all right, so going back to the original question, what is a healthy food? So a healthy food is made of things that grow in the ground, right? So fruit and starches and legumes, which are all the different kinds of beans, nuts and seeds. And it's not the junk food that it's made in factories that you know looks like food, but we have no idea when we look at the ingredients what kind of food is actually in there or animal products. All right. Uh, really quick, let's talk about weight loss. Uh, when it comes to weight loss, we all think like, oh, it's my fault. If I'm overweight, that means it's my fault. And I know the answer is probably just, I just have to eat less and I just have to move more. Well, anybody that has ever tried that, they probably went crazy, right? And the truth is that, um, you know, a monkey in the wild, they never think about how many bananas should I have today? I'm going to have two and a half bananas for breakfast and one for snack and three later, right? So there's no counting of anything that they're eating. They're just eating until they're um, satisfied. And that is because they're eating the natural food that is made for them. So we have, yeah, as long as we eat the natural food that we, was made for us, we're not going to have an issue with that uh, weight. And um, we have to, it's this concept called calorie density. So if you're interested in weight loss, that's definitely something that you need to look into, calorie density. And that's, you know, not all calories are created equal. And this is a picture of our stomach. So the purple things that you see over there, those are little, our stomach has like different kind of uh, receptors. And this receptor inside our stomach, they look at the quality of the food, right? So vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and different things that we gave them. And then there's also receptors on the outside of the stomach, and they look at the quantity of the food. How much food did you give me today? Okay. And those receptors respond, send a signal to your brain and say, okay, you're full, you had enough, it's good to go. So this is how different foods um, kind of trigger different kind of receptors. So if we look at oil, all the stomachs that you're looking at right now, they all have 500 calories. So it's all identical, right? But if I choose to eat oil, so that's very greasy food, right? I'm eating 500 calories, but I'm only hitting maybe one or two of those tiny little receptors inside the stomach. And I'm definitely not hitting the ones on the outside of the stomach so that my brain is going to say, you're still hungry. You need to eat some more right? And then when it goes to cheese, it's a little bit better than meat is a little bit better. But look at the potato, rice, beans, and fruits and, and, and vegetables. All, when you eat fruits and vegetables, then all those receptors are being triggered and you eat the 500 calories and you say, I'm good, I'm full. Um, and, but if you eat the other kind of food, you're going to be hungry. That's why all these diets that uh, recommend cutting cutting on um, the amount that you eat and measuring and all this. They're very, they work on short term. Everything works on short term. I can cut my arm, you know, God forbid, and, and then I'm, waiting le I'm weighing less on the scale. So on the short term, everything works, but it's really have to look at the long term. What do you want to accomplish with this weight loss? And if it's health that you want to accomplish, then it's definitely the plant-based um, foods that you want to eat in order to really kick in all those receptors. Um, so this is a little cheat sheet that normally I give to um, people in class. You, can, you know, feel free to take a picture of it. So when it comes to weight loss, we want to eat those kind of foods that are on the green, right? So the legumes, the unprocessed carbohydrates, the fruits and the vegetables, and we want to stay away from the animal foods and the um, processed foods and oil and fats. And if you really look at the fats, you know, it's, the, the oil is really, really high. And a lot of times we kind of sabotage ourselves. We have like this beautiful, awesome salad, but then we put olive oil on top. And the moment you put, you know, any kind of salad dressing that it's oil based um, on it, then um, you're just adding a bunch more calories and you're thinking, but I'm really eating healthy. I'm not sure why, you know, I'm not losing weight. And that's because without realizing we're sabotaging ourselves because of the 
um, oil that we put on it. Uh, the only exception in here are the nuts and seeds. So they're very healthy for you, they're good, but they're really high in calorie density. So if you're looking to lose weight, you really want to try to eat a little bit less of that, okay, to, to eliminate those until you get to the right age. So green, eat all you want, and you're still going to lose weight until you get to your normal weight. So if you're at your normal weight, you're going to see that you're not going to continue. Your body is going to know how to adjust. And then if you eat, you know, um, red foods, even if you eat just tiny, tiny little bit, you're going to gain weight. And a good example that I normally give, you know, if I go to like a buffet or something like that, when I go out with my friends, they look at my plates and they're like, Ella, but you eat so much. And my plates look really big in terms of volume, right? So I eat a lot of food, but the food that I eat is really low in calories. So I eat rice and potatoes and beans and salads and veggies but it's really low in calories. And they're saying like, I'm just gonna have a tiny little bit of cheese and I'm gonna have a tiny little bit of meat. So their food looks like this. They're still hungry when they're done, but they already ate more calories than I did in my big, huge meal, okay? Just to give you an idea. All right, so this is like the little example of, of four tablespoons of olive oil. They're all the same calories, but look at the difference, right? So when we go and we dip into that bread with a little oil, we already ingested maybe the same amount of calories that the whole meal would be. So skip that oil. All right, um, Dr. McDougall loves to say, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. So <laughs> I love that saying. Um, and this is where we find the, the fats, right? It's hidden in you know ice creams and cheeses and all these things. So be aware of that if you're interested in weight loss. Uh, in particular. All right, let's see. So um, how do we compare, you know, meat versus plants? So let's quickly look at this. You know, I talked a little bit how um, calories are not created equal, but if we take the same amount of calories, the part that has meat, right, it has fat in it. The broccoli has tiny little fat, just enough for your brain function and everything else that your body needs, but it doesn't have that extra fat that is going to mess with your blood vessel, right? It has all the protein that you need. It actually even has more protein calorie per calorie, as you can see. Plus, uh, the meat has also cholesterol, whereas if you look at the plants, it has the vitamins and essential nutrients and prevents disease, so on, so on, and so on. Oh, there's another little... Um, example of that, right? So cholesterol, it has water, and it's good, way better, better for the environment to eat the beans and so on. All right, um, and I know that usually people are concerned about iron, so I, I, I put a slide over here when it comes to, both, to iron. So there's two different kinds of iron, the heme and the non-heme, right? The heme one comes from animal, and it's really more bio, bio, uh, bioavailable. That means we absorb all of it. Uh, but if we have too much iron, it becomes toxic. And this is especially uh, important for men to know because us as women, we have that monthly cycle where we get rid of extra iron in our body. Um, but for men, it could become um, toxic and dangerous, right? Uh, and then the non-heme kind of iron comes from uh, plant sources and it's less bioavailable that means we don't really absorb it all, so we're going to have to continue eating this different kind of foods. However, uh, our body really just takes what it needs. This is the iron that I need, and if you give it too much iron and your body already has enough iron, it's not going to absorb that much. If you are lacking in iron and your body needs a little bit more, it's going to absorb a lot more. So your body really knows what to do when it comes to the plants versus when it comes from the animal because it's two different kinds. Um, where do we get it? You know, um, from, from different kinds of foods again. And it's also very important if we pair um, vitamin C with iron rich foods because vitamin C helps to absorb that as well. Um, so I remember when my son, actually we were at one of his um, doctor appointments. My daughter was okay, everybody else was okay. But my son was um, lacking some iron and they said, make sure you give him vitamin C with it. So that's it. All right, let's talk about the, um, if it's expensive or not. So um, really a lot of people think it's expensive, but if we really think about like different kinds of fresh foods that we can have that are plant-based, these are the cheapest foods that we can find out there. Um, you know, the cabbage and onions and potatoes, like, you know, these are really the cheapest kind of foods that are really healthy for us. So we don't have to think about in, in terms of like whole foods and, you know, make it complicated and really have to think about like those expensive foods. We can eat plant-based with very inexpensive kind of foods. 
um, when it comes to dry, oopsie, when it comes to dry goods, you know, let's think about rice and lentils and different kinds of beans. And again, if you buy the dry beans and you make it yourself, it's even way um, more inexpensive than if you were to get it cooked. Um, when it comes to frozen, you can find frozen um, fruits. Um, you can find frozen vegetables. And actually in many cases, these are healthier than the regular ones that you find, the fresh ones that you find in the store. And that is because they are, um, everything that is frozen, it's picked when it's the ripest, when it's really ripen, they just take it, they clean it fresh, freeze it, and it's good to go. Whereas if we're eating a tomato, for example, uh, that tomato was picked when it was probably still green and it stayed in the storage room for another week or two and then it stays in the store for another week or two and then it comes to your house. So you're really not eating fresh, you're eating you know, a couple of weeks old um, worth of produce. So a lot of times frozen vegetables are, uh, could be even healthier than fresh ones unless you're getting from like a you know, locally farm and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, right now there's like mixed vegetables that all you have to do is just open the bag, throw it in a stir fry or something like that, and your dinner is ready, ready to go. So it's really convenient for us. And there's nothing wrong with canned food. We just have to make sure that, you know, the, they're BPA free, the cans. But again, look at the ingredients in the bag. Sometimes they have some sodium, so you have to watch out for that. But these are a great option and my pantry is full of dry beans, but it's also full of canned food. So I'm always having a combination of whatever one, there's no time. Um, all right, so how would the food look like? Now, some of the pictures that you're gonna see over here, they're not beautiful professional pictures because I just took them right before I ate. So I have some slides to give to some people. Um, so these are some oatmeals. The, on the right side is like a, a peanut butter oatmeal. The other side is a, my favorite, my, to go breakfast, blueberry. I always have frozen blueberries in the refrigerator and I just throw them in with some oatmeal and some plant-based milk and that's my breakfast. You can put all that and throw some spinach for a smoothie for a breakfast, um, pancakes, and I'm going to demo some waffles later on for you guys today. Oh, those are the waffles right there that we're going to learn how to make. Um, you know, some um, uh, tofu that's, um, uh, scrambled tofu that you can see over there that kind of looks like eggs, right? Some grits. So, um, you know, this is like my weekend kind of splurge, um, the little breakfast. And this is my to go to breakfast, right? In terms of lunches, my kids love sushi cake. So we make that on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, some hummus wraps with some veggies, some different kind of pizzas with different kind of sauces on it. Um, you know, just uh, some potatoes and some, some veggies on the side. This is like a mac and cheese that my kids like that we make sometimes, some quesadillas. Here are some examples of dinners, different kind of pastas. We love pastas, different kind of, you know, bean meatballs, mushrooms and salad on the side. We love burgers night. My kids love it. We do uh, fries in the oven or in the air fryer. Um, these are some... Um, bean um burgers um yeah so you know it, some indian food it does not have to be complicated right um that's like some spanish some nachos we have nachos night almost every week my kids love that and even dessert you know we can have carrot cakes and brownies and um different kind of things so it's we're it, really not missing a lot when it comes to plant-based uh, be careful not to drink your calories if you're looking for weight loss. There's a lot of calories hidden um, inside different drinks, so just go for water. And if you want some flavor, just throw in some fruit and make your own little flavored drinks and you'll be good to go. All right, so um, we really have the power to choose how we live. And if you were, if I would say, okay, um, if you're a doctor and somebody comes to you and says, um, I'm really suffering. I, I think I'm getting asthma. I'm coughing a lot. I'm having all the symptoms that a smoker would do. You would probably say, stop smoking. That's right. You would say, stop smoking, right? That's the solution. You would say, quit. Well, what if somebody comes and it has all this other, you know, liver issues and that kind of stuff, which are symptoms from alcohol, uh, from alcohol you would say, stop drinking. But what if you have somebody, a patient that comes, is overweight, that has the, you know, pre-diabetes, or maybe already has diabetes, digestive issues, that kind of stuff. What would you say? We can't say stop eating. 
right? And in the United States, unfortunately, this is what we say. Well, here's a medication for this, and here's a medication for this, and here's a medication for this. And we really have to think about changing that mindset. And instead of uh, finding a temporary solution for something that is wrong, let's really think about long term and how can I cure this so it doesn't happen again. And that is changing our lifestyle and the way we eat. And like I said earlier, toxicity does not build um, overnight. It's not like today I'm healthy and tomorrow I have cancer, right? So all this is happening in time, you know, and I talk about like, you know, my children, when they were little, they just ate, you know, uh, breast milk. And then as soon as they got one, I, oh, I made a birthday cake for them. And here they go into all that sugar and all those colorants. And then they go to school and they eat all the food, the junk food that it's, you know, served at schools and so on. And then we, we realize that we get to an age and all of a sudden we're having this disease and we're like, well, how, how did that happen? I don't understand. So it happened in time. Toxicity builds in time. And um, they're really the consequences of everything that we do day by day by day. And, you know, I, I sometimes I ask students, I said, look at me, tell me on a, on a scale of one to 10, what would you give me? How healthy do you think I am? And they're like, well, miss, you're teaching this, so you must be a 10, right? And I say, you don't know. You don't really know just by looking at the outside of the body how healthy I am because there's many people, you know, I, I give example of the person who, um, you know, uh, was doing the biggest loser and then nice and fit. And then they had a, a heart disease on the treadmill. I mean, a heart attack on the treadmill. And many cases, heart attack in, in a person, it's like the one and only symptom that they get. It's like one and they're gone, right? So we're lucky if somebody leaves to a heart attack and they have the chance to change. So just because they're not sick, it doesn't mean that we're completely healthy. We have to work on that on a regular basis. All right. So again, just to kind of review, plant-based versus animal-based diet. Plant foods are high in fiber. They have no cholesterol. They're very low in fat. Caloric density, they're low, and they're antioxidants, whereas animal foods, it's exactly the opposite. All right, so um, one thing usually when people start eating a power plate, which we call this way of eating, um, the only thing that is missing, it's really the B12. Uh, and B12, it's not really a vitamin, it's a bacteria. And we, got, we used to get that bacteria and animals get that bacteria because they eat from the ground, they eat the, the dirt of the ground, right? And right now we kind of like wash everything that we eat, which is good because we're not getting all the crazy kind of uh, other, other kind of diseases. But um, as we get older, we are absorbing less and less and less of B12. And regardless if we're plant-based or not, we're going to have to supplement eventually with B12. Our absorption in, uh, decreases with age. But um, people who are plant-based, because they're not eating you know, this meat that this animal ate directly from the ground, this dirt, and they have the, uh, the B12 bacteria into their tissue because we're not eating that, then we might have to supplement with a B12 supplement, which is, you know, very inexpensive. Um, I just have something I take once a week or so, and I just go to the doctor on a regular basis and I have them check my B12. And so far, um, I've never had deficiency. So yeah, so that's just something to keep in mind. All right. So as I'm finishing up my presentation, you know, just wanted to leave you with the idea that every bite that you take, it's either going to fight disease or is going to feed into it. You know, there's really not um, much in between. And I'm going to show you a little video in a little bit when I go and I prep my kitchen. Uh, but just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. And my contact information actually is going to be on your resource. I can leave that. All right, so I don't know how we're doing. Do we want a one minute break, a bathroom break? Everybody? Or do you want to see this one minute video and then you take a bathroom break while I set up in the kitchen? I'm good with doing the video right now if everybody else is. And then All right, so this is just like a one minute video and then um, we're going to have a one minute break so you guys can run to the bathroom if you need to grab a drink and I'll move my uh, computer to the kitchen to start cooking, okay? All right, let's see. Actually, let me, I'm not sure. I can you hear it okay? Okay, let me just... What will your last 10 years look like? Huh? Will you be 
quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? It's time to decide. The average okay. Canadian. So just wanted to leave you with that. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And let's just take a one minute break and then we'll come to start cooking. And then we can take a look at the questions in the meantime and see if there's anything. If you don't mind, um, Caroline, just kind of like read them to me as I'm prepping. Yeah, yeah. There weren't, um, there weren't a ton. It was just different ideas again for protein. Um, and my, my husband answered a little because we, we eat a lot of beans. We eat a lot of lentils and rice, um, and kale also. So lots of greens, I think, you know, leafy green things we eat a lot of. Um, so it was just kind of, if you have, I mean, do you have, you mentioned the beans, the, the nuts and the seeds kind of thing. Is there anything yeah. else? So again, it's, uh, when it comes to the protein, we're just concerned that we're not getting enough. So right now my husband, because we're, we're both teachers and we went into this distance learning thing. So he really wants to get buffer. So he's eating lentils two or three times a day to really get extra protein. But um, really just, you know, a lot of different kinds of beans, um, you know, leafy greens, um, uh, oatmeal and grains, rice, rice and, and uh, quinoa and that kind of stuff. They contain a lot of protein. So uh, really just kind of build up, you know, your, your meals the way you really enjoy it. And you're, you're going to get plenty of protein. But if you're looking for like extra protein, you know, because you're really trying to, you know, for your children that are growing or something, um, you know, then you can just, you know, in increase and get specific kind of beans or like, you know, for my kids, I give them a little extra peanut butter, more peanut butter than I eat, for example, right? Or more nuts and seeds than I would eat um, just because they're growing. My children are eight and 10, by the way. Yeah. All right, is everybody back? Are we ready? Uh, I'm so not used to sitting down. Like I need a little bit of stretch over here. Okay, so I have two different cameras going on and I'm going to switch to the other one so that you guys can see better. All right, and I guess at this point, uh, if I'm doing something, you can either type in there or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, you know, if I'm doing something that you're like, hey, what is she doing? Oh, wait a minute, I didn't plug in my second camera. Sorry. Um, and I think the light should be okay, but if it's not okay, I think I have an um, extra light that I can use. Okay, excuse me one second, I forgot to turn it on. All right. What did I do? That was me, huh? Okay. I still didn't turn on. Sorry, everybody. It worked right before we started. We practiced and yeah. it worked. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Is no. it back? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, the recipes that I'm going to give you, I'm going to share um, those recipes with you. Okay, so you're going to have that. You don't really have to take um, note of it. Uh, I'm just gonna pull it out so that I know the order that I'm going through. And the first one I would like to do for you guys is waffles. And this is one of my kids' favorite uh, breakfasts. And this is how we do it. So usually I just have um, one cup of, um, I mean, one banana. And this recipe I call one, one, one. And uh, you can make pancakes with it, uh, or you can make waffles with it. It's basically the same, whatever we're doing. 
and I'm just keeping the peel over here for compost. So basically you just have one banana and you can use any kind of blender. It doesn't have to be like a strong kind of powerful blender. And then, um, so it's called 111 because it's one banana, one cup of oats and one cup of plant-based milk, okay? But when I use um, for waffles, I notice that if I make it right, right, right away, all I have to do now is just blend this up. If I make it right away, the batter is going to be a little bit runny. So I like to add an extra cup, uh, half a cup of oats. But if I leave um, this a little bit, you know, while like I prep this and then I get my waffle iron ready, then the oats kind of soak up the liquid and it gets thick enough. So then I just leave it just like that. So this is basically the base um, recipe, right? And then I would just blend this up all together. I'm not going to do it right now because it's just going to make noise, but I'm going to show you the finished product. And the finished product would be something like this, like a nice, beautiful, thick waffle. And the way I like to um, top it is with some either fresh fruit or my kids like some vegan chocolate chips sometimes. And when I make my syrup, I like to use um, the maple syrup, but then I also put, um, let's say, you know, one cup of maple syrup, I put it right in the blender and I do two or three cups of frozen berries or blueberries or something like that. And then I mix that all together um, make sure it's defrosted berries. And then I use that as a syrup. And I find that when I do that, you know, my kids are really used to this blue looking kind of syrup and you're having so many vitamins and, and minerals already in that syrup. And it's not just all the sugar that comes with it. And it's really super sweet. So you're not really going to miss anything. So that is our recipe. Number one, the waffles. Any questions about that Caroline? No, I don't, I don't see. Okay, perfect. All right, let's move to recipe number two. My kitchen is really kind of small, so. <laughs> All right, the next one, uh, we're going to make hummus. Now, to make the hummus, um, I'm just going to bring all my stuff right here. All right, so to make the hummus, I use about three cups, uh, three different um, cans. You can totally uh, do your own uh, chickpeas from that are dry and then you boil them and then you save them. Um, but usually I find myself making hummus when I just need something really quick on the table, a quick snack or somebody's coming over. So I always like to have these cans um, in my house. And what I did is I took the liquid out but I did not throw it away. I saved the liquid and this is called aquafaba. And there's a lot of different vegan recipes where you use this instead of oil when you're roasting some potatoes or something like that. I've seen some recipes where people make um, whipped cream. I haven't attempted that, but um, just so you know, they use this and only from the chickpeas, the other beans, not really. So what you would do is you would drain the chickpeas, save the water, so you just have three um, cans of chickpeas. And for this, uh, a powerful blender would work best, but also you can use a food processor as well. Uh, that's fine as well. And then you would use about one cup of the served liquid instead of using the oil, okay? So, and if you like it a little bit more runnier, you can use more water. I find that usually this is about enough, but every now and then I, I add some more. Ella, I, I have a quick question with the, the yeah. piece. Do you, you don't take the skin off or anything, you know? No, you no. Just put it on? I, I know, I never do. I'm a little bit of a, of a lazy cook. So I like everything quick, 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 quick. And yeah, it never bothered me. I never take them off, no. I like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, and then to this, so we have the, the um, uh, chickpeas in there and we added the water and then we add some garlic. Now my husband really likes garlic, so I tend to add a lot more for him, he's Dominican. My kids, so-so, um, but usually I go about three or four pieces of garlic, but really, you know, decide what you want. And then next, um, the juice of a lemon. So let me grab my knife right here. And then 
I'm just going to squeeze a lemon right in there. And you can definitely use um, the store-bought lemon juice. I use that when I run out of fresh lemons, but I always find that the fresh lemons, um, fresh lemon juice gives it a special kind of um, kick. It's just, you know, tastes better. So I just go with that. Okay. And then to this, now um, you can add a little bit of salt. If you do add salt, make sure that it's always um, salt that has iodine added to it. All the other salts are okay for us, but they don't have iodine and iodine is something that we only get kind of like from this or sea, um, sea vegetables. So it's important to have iodine in our diet. So I just kind of go through this kind of salt, not the other ones. Uh, but I don't add salt to my hummus when I make it personally, because a lot of times, the cans that I buy, they have a little bit of sodium to it. And because I'm using the liquid, I just try to skip it. And then in the end, if I find like, well, it was really not salty enough, then I do use it. But, you know, I usually try to do it without it first. Um, and in general, I like to do my food on the unsalty side, and then I add salt as I eat. Um, this way you eat a little less sodium than if you were to cook with it because it kind of blends in. And then you're always going to add a little bit extra. Um, because when, when the salt is added to the food, it kind of loses, um, loses some of it. Um, so yeah, that's the thing about salt. And then I add a little bit of cumin to it. Um, but this is, you know, totally optional. I like it, so we use it. And then another thing that um, I used to do with the hummus. So basically, this is the basic recipe for just simple hummus. Um, I did find tahini which tahini is just like a sesame seed, uh, ground up sesame seed, just like peanut butter is ground up peanuts, right? It's just sesame seeds. And this makes it even creamier. So whenever I do have tahini in my house, I do use some of it. And you guys have the exact measurements um, in the recipe that I'll send with you. Uh, but again, I just kind of eyeball it. And this is how I make my hummus. And I just want to show you the texture of this. So I'm going to actually go ahead and blend this. So um, hopefully the zoom is going to make the sound not so loud so that it doesn't go crazy on it. And my blender is right here on the side. So hopefully it's not too loud. So just one second. maybe you guys would like to see this part I'm using this Vitamix kind of blender. oh actually you cannot see it sorry all right so what you're left with is something like this, right? So a nice and creamy kind of hummus. And you can blend it more or less, right, to your liking. So that's the base of hummus. If you are interested in trying hummus um, but not garlic it, you can do roasted red pepper and then, um, you know, just add that to whatever we just did. Um, I tried sometimes like a chocolate kind of hummus for my kids where I, um, I used um, some cocoa powder and some maple syrup and I skipped the garlic, right, but you, and, and the lemon juice. So you can still do the, the regular chickpeas, um, but just skip that and you don't need the salt and that kind of stuff. So that's the um, quick hummus recipe. All right, moving along. The next thing we're going to do is the, we're going to make something I I just made that for lunch today. It's um, bacon made of tofu. So the tofu that I use, it's basically um, organic um, tofu. And tofu, for those of you who are not really familiar, is just soybeans that are um, 
mixed together. And for to make the bacon kind, you want to use the extra firm or the foam kind. Um, that's better. And you always want to try as much as you can to buy the organic one because um, the non-organic one, oftentimes the soy that it's um, uh, grown in the United States is genetically modified. So if you can, go for the organic kind of soy. And then when you are doing your tofu, um, try, when you take it out, you're going to have to press it for a little bit. So I put it over here and I put a big heavy pot on top. Right, it actually went sideways. So I put it like this just so we can release some of the liquid that it has. And now, if you can see over there, I don't know how, yeah, you can see. This is the liquid that was inside the tofu block, right? So I'm going to um, not use that, just get, get rid of that. And this is the tofu block that I'm going to use. So to do this, you're going to kind of slice your tofu into, you know, pieces like this, right? So not really um, skinny, but not really thick. My kids like to have a little bit of bite into it, but you just kind of, you don't want it to break apart, but this is how you want to slice them so that they kind of resemble that bacon-ish thing when you put it in a sandwich or something. Um, all right, so you just kind of go like this, right? And you just slice it off, actually. I'm not gonna slice the rest of it. You guys don't need to see me slicing it. But I'm going to make right now the sauce um, that is going to go with it. And for that, these are the different things that I'm going to need. And I'll just grab a bowl so I can put it right inside. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to put it is going to be six um, tablespoons of nutritional yeast. And nutritional yeast, if you are not familiar with it, um, this is it. It's kind of like a yeast. It's not the kind of yeast that it's in beer. Um, it's a different kind. And it really makes everything kind of um, have like a, a cheesy, it's kind of just like a powder. It makes a cheesy kind of smell. So when I make mac and cheese or any kind of cheesy like sauces, I use nutritional yeast. And I buy this from Job Lot um, most of the time but they have good deals all the time, but you can find it at Stop and Shop and Walmart and that kind of stuff. So we're going to start with three uh, tablespoons of nutritional yeast. And sometimes I find that I need a little bit more extra sauce. So you might wanna, you know, depending on how much you do, you double it. But usually the sauce that I make is just enough for the two blocks. Then to that, I'm going to add six tablespoons of maple syrup. And that is what's going to make that sweetie, sweet kind of um, taste to the um, tofu. And tofu, by the way, doesn't really have a taste on its own. It kind of absorbs whatever taste, whatever you know, flavors you put next to it. That's why you can do like a tofu scramble and it tastes more like eggs. And if you make it this way, you know, it's more like bacon. There's actually a show coming up that I'm going to take part of this Saturday. I can give you information if you're interested um, in it. Uh, it's going to be live on Facebook and we're going to do a lot of instructors like me. We're going to go you know, from city to city all across the country, whatever all different instructors leave. And we're all going to do a recipe on tofu and I'm actually gonna make this one. Uh, but they're going to show you a lot of different variety of tofu recipes if you're interested. All right, the next thing I'm going to add is soy sauce. And I really like to use the liquid amino um, for soy sauce, it's a Bragg's uh, brand. And that's because this is, has way less sodium than the regular soy sauce. Um, you know, regular soy sauce has about 600 to 900, this is 300 milligrams of sodium. So I like to use this whenever we have sushi or anytime I need some kind of soy sauce in the house. And I get this at um, Walmart. All right, so I'll use three um, tablespoons of that. Okay. Now I'm going to add something called liquid smoke. And too bad you're not here because I can pass it around to, for you guys to smell it. You're really not in class, but it's really liquidy. It really makes, makes it um, smell kind of like bacon-ish. Um, and you find this again at um, Walmart or um, 
or job lab. And I'm just going to use one tablespoon of that. Go ahead. Ella, uh, we have a question um, from Kelly. Um, do you know if that, the uh, soy sauce thing is gluten-free? Um, let's see if this one is gluten-free. I know that some soy sauce, yeah, actually it is. This brand, it is gluten-free. It does say gluten-free on it, yep. Thank you. Yep, great question. Right. And then another question is the liquid smoke. What are the ingredients in that, do you know? Uh, yes. So it has water, mesquite smoke flavor, vinegar, molasses, and camera color and salt. Um, and like you saw, we don't really use a lot of it. We just use a tiny little bit, you know, like a tablespoon for the whole thing, just to give it that like smoky kind of flavor. But if you are not okay with the ingredients, you can totally skip that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. And then some onion powder and some garlic powder. All right. So I'm just going to go oh, about two tablespoons, teaspoons of this. And this is going to give um, some kind of vo volume on the tofu so that it's not um, the sauce doesn't kind of just run out of it, um, you know, doesn't come right off. And then just mix that kind of up together. Oh, where's my fork? I'll just use this. So just kind of mix all that together. And then we're just going to run the tofu through it and then we're going to bake it okay so what you would do is you would turn on the oven on like 350 or so i kind of do everything on 350 uh, but you know you can play with the oven so right now this is a silicone mat by the way um again i get it at job lot and I like it because you don't have to use oil to it. Um, and it's just reusable, you use it over and over, but you can also use parchment paper. So now you're just going to put the tofu to it, through it like this, and then just place it on the side into the, the pan, just like that. Okay. I'm not going to finish it all right now, but just to give you an idea. So that's what you would do. And then you will just bake it. Um, you will just put it in the oven um, for about, I, I think when I made it today, I cooked it for probably about um, 20 minutes on one side and 20 minutes on the other side. And I always like to put it at the end in the broiler for like five minutes, just watch it so it doesn't burn. I like it to be a little bit more crunchy. Um, and then, what you are left with is something like this, okay? So it's, um, you know, a nice little tofu bacon. So it has like the tofu kind of bacon um, flavor, um, stays great in sandwiches. Yep, just to kind of show you. And then um, I just put it in with like some um, uh, letters and tomatoes, some avocado, and you know, that's what my kids had for lunch today, delicious. So I highly recommend that you guys try that. Let me just rinse my hands real quick. That looked really good. I'm definitely trying that one. <laughs> uh, my kids love it. So whenever I make that, I have to make about four blocks of tofu because as soon as it comes out of the oven, my kids are like, hmm, what well, smells good? And they just pass by and they just eat it. So then, you know, I don't have anything left over for my sandwiches because they already chunked it all up. So that's that. Okay, and then the last recipe that I wanted to make for, actually there's two more that I wanted to make. Um, the next one I wanted to make is uh, a dinner. And that would be like a chili. A real quick, um, Ella, somebody yes. asked, does the, the tofu bacon, does that reheat well? Uh, yes, it does, it does. It's really good. And, and you can just, you know, reheat in the microwave for a few seconds. 
uh, or put it back in the oven for a little bit. Yeah, it does. Usually that's why I say like I make about four blocks of it and I just have it, you know, throughout the week. Yeah. Sometimes of meals. Yes. Great question. Um, all right. So over here, I, um, I make my chili and this is like one minute chili. And my kids, oh, I didn't get actually the chance to um, rinse this. So I'm actually just going to tell you about it. I'm not actually going to make it, but basically all you do is you get your favorite salsa. My kids love this peach salsa. I get it from Jabla. Just open that up, put it in there. And you can eat this cold or warm, right? Then I would take some black beans, make sure you rinse it, and then some corn. All right, so this you wanna drain and rinse. And then you just mix that all together in the pan. You can eat it cold or warm. Sometimes my kids are like, oh, I just want lunch right now. And I said, okay, go make yourself chili. And they come, they open this, they rinse it, they put it in there, and they just eat it with corn chips. Or if I wanna, if I know I have time to make it, I put it over rice or something, and I serve it with some cilantro and a little bit of lemon juice on top. Delicious, quick, one-minute dinner. Okay, so that would have been like a, a, a quick chili and, you know, I always thought that I have to saute the onions and the peppers and all this to make a nice little um, chili, but you can totally cheat with your favorite kind of salsa. And depending on what salsa you get, you can change the flavor. So this is like a sweeter kind, right? But you can get like a spicy and mild one and all that. So you can definitely play with your chili. And one thing that I like to add when I make chili, especially if I make it for um, guests that are not from I, I use this product called PVP. And I buy this at Jablat. It's basically just um, uh, dehydrated soy. And the way it looks is, it looks like this. It's just like, um, you know, let's see how the camera will look. It's just like dry little um, tiny pieces. But then the way you use it is you just put it in water. So, you know, usually I use a container like this. I dump it in there and then I fill a bunch of water in it and I just let it stay for, you know, five, 10 minutes while I get all the other ingredients ready. And then when I'm ready to use it, I drain the water and then I, so basically I just rehydrated this, right? So then you just drain the water and then you use this. And what it does to a meal, it gives you that ground meat type of feel. Um, so, you know, anytime you made something like taco wish or something that you would use ground meat, this TVP product that I get at job lot is amazing for, for that, that kind of feel and that kind of taste. All right. Ella, real, Ella, real quick. Yeah. Somebody asked with the peach salsa, is there any sugar in that? Yes, there is sugar in this salsa. Yes. But okay. you can definitely look at different kinds of salsa that you like. You look in the back of the ingredients and make, you know. If you do not want one with sugar, you can look for one that does not have sugar. But this one does. Yes, this one in particular does. Okay. All right. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is the uh, salad dressings, right? So I told you how not to have salad dressing that contain oil. So then you say, well, if I can have that, what can I have for a salad dressing, right? So this recipe, it's called three, two, one. And the way it works is you start with a, and, and when I say three, two, one, it's not my recipe, it's Jane Assistant's, and she uses uh, a proportion of three. So if you want a lot of salad dressing, then you go with something like this, three of this, two of this, one of this, right? If you want just for like a tiny, tiny little bit, then you just go with like this, right? So depending on how much salad dressing you wanna have, for the week or for just one meal, you decide how much of everything you wanna use. So I'm just going to use this for now, right? So if I say three, I'm going to start with three of um, ratios of balsamic vinegar. And any balsamic vinegar would work. And this recipe is so versatile because depending on the balsamic vinegar that you use, you're going to change up a little bit of the taste, right? So you can really play with flavors. So I just have a random balsamic vinegar that I had in the um, pantry. So I'm just gonna go with three of this. Then I'm going to go with two of mustard. And again, depending on the kind of mustard that you use, you're changing it up. So if you go Dijon, or if you go yellow, if you go spicy or sweet, right? 
So right now I just have a Dijon mustard over here. So I'm just going to put two of those. One and two. And then my one is going to be, again, maple syrup. One of that, and that's it. You just mix this thing around really, really good. And if you make a lot of it, then, you know, you have salad dressing for, um, you know, for the week. And that's it. That is your salad dressing. Three to one, no oil, delicious balsamic vinaigrette. And like I said, it's very versatile depending on what kind of, um, balsamic vinegar use. And one time I was getting ready for a class and as I was getting ready for the class, uh, I went to buy different balsamic vinegar to make exactly this recipe. And I found, uh, I bought um, this balsamic vinegar. Let me see if I have it right here, yes. I bought this Rachel Ray from Walmart. I said, oh, this like is going to be a good one. Let me try it. And then when I took it home and I tried it, it's actually a, a, redu a reduced balsamic vinegar. I didn't pay attention. So what that means is that it's thicker. And when I tried it by itself, it did not need anything else. No mustard, no maple syrup, no nothing. It's amazing just as is um, on a salad. So if you like uh, balsamic vinegar, this is like a sweeter kind, Rachel Ray brand. And then I also found a similar one at Wall at a Job Lot that again it's gluten free, and it's a reduction one. So it's kind of like a glaze that I use for um, a salad dressing. And then the last one, which uh, let's see, oh my kids moved it away from here. Hmm, my kids love this balsamic vinegar that I got lately. They moved it. They, it's a drinkable balsamic vinegar. Let me just run and get, I have another one in the other room. So give me one second. I really want to show you. As you can tell, I really love job lot. That's like my to go to store. And they have this balsamic vinegar, which is, um, drink balsamic vinegar and they had it on crazy deal which by the way if you're not familiar with job lot crazy deals what means is if you buy ten dollars worth of product you get a ten dollar gift card back and you go home with a product so it's a great way to go shopping and i bought this on crazy deals they had them and i got like 20 of them and my kids love them so much um, and it's a drinkable vinegar so you're supposed to mix one part of vinegar with um, another five parts of water and drink a little bit just like this. But my kids put this on spinach. They just put a little bit of it and that's their salad dressing for um, spinach. So, and th this is like a, pom a cherry one, then they have blueberry ones and pomegranate ones. So uh, these are different things that we use for um, salad dressing. Um, so those were all the demonstrations that I had. Let me go back and change my screen with you guys so you can see me. Um, oopsie. Okay, here I am. So um, yes, what other questions kind of, any questions about the cooking demonstration so far? Anything well, else? I have, a, I have a question. So you don't use oil at all. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> the, go ahead. Yeah, I only use um, spray, oil spray, when I do make my waffles. Sometimes um, I use the oil spray for every two or three different waffles, because if not, it sticks. Uh, but that's the only way I use, I, I try to use oil in the house. So if you do have to saute onions and garlic and all that, how, what would you use? Great question. So just water. So I would start with a hot pan, right? And then just put your onion right in there. And um, one, one way that um, uh, in plant-based cooking, they say that if you sprinkle a little bit of water in the pan and the water's dancing around, that means it's ready. So you just throw in your onions and then just make sure that you keep on mixing constantly. 
because uh, if not, you're going to see that it's going to start to get brown at the bottom and the onions have water already in them. So they're going to sweat a little bit. So there's different ways. Okay, you can cover them and put them on a lower heat and they're just going to sweat a little bit or you can just mix them uh, really, really good. And as soon as you notice that it gets brown, just add a little bit of water at a time, you know, a teaspoon, another teaspoon. And what that does, it takes the sugar that just came out of the onions and caramelizes the onions really, really good. So you do not need water. You can use, you know, soda, beer, you can use anything else to saute. You do not need oil. Okay. Just use a little bit of water. But yeah, that's what I just use, saute okay. with water. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Kathleen. Um, there are so many plant-based websites out there. What is your go-to? And also, what is a certification you have? Because she'd like to check it out. Sure. Yes. So the certification that I have is Food for Life. Right. So it's, it comes from PCRM. Um, and I can put that information. Um, for, actually, I do have that information. Let me show you what I'm sharing with you guys, because I think it's going to answer this question. So let me just open my document. Uh, oh, here it is. Um, yeah, so I, I, I created this um, paper that I wanted to share with you, this document that I'm going to share with you guys in a little bit that contains um, all this information. All right, so let's see, let me move us out of the way. All right, so this is what you will have. You will have my information, my contact information in case you want to um, get in touch with me. And I created a Facebook page. I'm not a, really a Facebook person, but um, just for people who do take my class, I didn't want to be bombarded with emails in my you know, own personal work email or something. So that's especially for just plant-based world. Um, and you can just, you know, on, on Facebook, on my page, if you do follow me, I'm going to add periodic things if I'm doing classes or if there's anything happening or, um, you know, I try to put, if I watch a lecture, um, cause my, every time I'm cooking or I'm cleaning in the house and there's nobody next to me, I just put some kind of learning thing and I just kind of listen and it keeps me motivated and keeps me going. Um, so whenever I'm like, Oh, this was amazing. I just go and put on, you know, Facebook so other people can see. So you have the recipe of the waffles. You have the hummus, you have the tofu, you have the chili, you have the three to one. And then these are the documentaries that I highly recommend. Um, I've seen all of them and they're actually, no, the species, I have not seen that one yet. Uh, but there are some available on, on Netflix. I would really, you know, if you're like, I don't know which one to watch, start with What the Health. What the Health has everything that I just told you in the class, but really explained really, really good. I had to watch that movie like five times to absorb everything they had in there. Great, great movie. Uh, Game Changers, if you want to get, you know, the athletes in your life to jump on board or the men, it's a great movie for them. Um, and another one of my favorite is Food Choices. I really, really love that one as well. But they're, you know, they're all really awesome. And then these are some YouTube lectures. Um, that um, I just find that they have good information. So the first one with TEDx, Ripos has done, it's a 17 minute um, YouTube and it's a great lecture that talks about, you know, kind of like what I gave you guys, but a little bit more condensed. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn is like a four minute video that just talks about why no oil. The cheese trap, Dr. Barnard, he really talks about why we're being addicted to cheese and how that's messing with our brain and all that stuff. So that's amazing. The pleasure ta uh, trap is another TEDx that really talks about how our taste buds change and how we are trapped into eating the salty kind of food. And when we hear people saying like, I love avocados and tomatoes, we look at them like they're crazy. Like, oh, you must like plant-based, that, that must suck for you. It's really not, you know, uh, it doesn't probably doesn't taste good because our taste, but are really just changed, but it's just a matter of getting used to it. It's kind of like going on a, on a movie theater when the movie already started and we're like, you can't see anything. But then after you sit down and you see the next person walking, you're like, look at them, right? Cause you cannot really see. So it's kind of the same. It's just about getting used to it. How not to die. Dr. Gregor is a an hour or so lecture that he did for um, Google a couple of years ago. Amazing information. Great. Um, the podcast with Rich Rolls, he interviews a lot of different doctors plant-based, so that's a great one to just kind of keep, you know, I usually like to have a little folder on my um, 
bookmark and then just kind of add all these things to it. So whenever I'm looking for some learning, I just like, hmm, let me see what I want to listen to today. Um, recipes and interviews again, Chef AJ, she's amazing. She went through this journey all by herself, you know, um, and she's an expert in weight loss. She's um, somebody that always interviews different people. Great to see. Some websites, so the first one is the PCRM website. So that's where you'll find information about how to become a Food for Life instructor if you're interested. And they also have different kinds of resources. They have uh, literature that you can buy. They have, you know, other Food for Life instructors all over the world. So if you're like, you know, my sister in Texas, she should really go and see this class. And we used to teach all these classes live, right? So people taste the food and all this. But right now we're all, you know, at home. Uh, but, you know, you can find Food for Life instructors all over the United States and uh, international, actually. Um, there's some, uh, the next one, Jane and um, Ann Asselson is the wife and the daughter of a cardiologist. And they do have this YouTube where they do a bunch of different recipes. So if you're like, oh, I just want to learn something, that's a place to go. Um, whenever I have a question like, is salt good for you? How about this? Where do I get iron? How about this? You know, whenever I have any question, I go to um, Dr. Greger's website, nutritionalfacts.org. He created this website just because, and you'll see a quick little three minute video right when you go on the website where he explains, I just created this video to share this information because his grandmother um, was, uh, you know, was sent home to die, but then uh, she discovered on a PBS something she saw, you know, Nathan Pritigan, which is like the pioneer of plant-based nutrition. And um, she went in to see him to say, oh, okay, let's see if I can do anything. And then she walked out, she went in a wheelchair and walked out and then she lived another, you know, many years. And she saw Dr. Gregor growing up and getting married and that kind of stuff. So that inspired him to become a doctor. So he created this website and that's all he does. He's a doctor, but he's not practicing. He's just reading all the literature that ever comes out and all the study. And then he makes quick two, three minute videos and articles for people like us to understand that information. So any questions that you have on any topic, you're probably going to find it right there. Um, another one that I really love is Dr. Clapper. He has another website, has different lectures and website. Um, Plant-based network is something that I recently just discovered, but it's been there for a while. And they have tons of different shows. And it's, you know, if you're looking, whatever you just got with me, you're going to get tons and tons and tons more um, from this website. And actually there's going to be a show that just started called So Many Cooks in the Kitchen. And that's where us, the Food for Life instructors come in and we go from kitchen to kitchen. So you're going to see me on TV soon, <laughs> but that's another place to go. And they have kids show, actually my kids are going to do a show soon on there. And they have, you know, different kinds of topics, lots of doctors, veggie fest and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a great resource to go to. Um, and then I, you know, plugged in my, my kids during this distance learning, they wanted to do a cooking, a YouTube channel on different things. And they have a little portion of some um, recipes, like five, six minute recipes. Um, there's not a lot of them, but if you want to show it to some children in your life to say, hey, you know, we can start cooking this way or just to get them um, inspired. Um, yeah, my kids are making different kinds of recipes in there um, that are plant based that you guys might like. Uh, including the waffles. And then these are just some books. And I, you know, when I created this for you guys, I really, oh, let me plug in my, my batteries. Um, when I created this um, page resource for you guys, I was like, oh, I'm gonna add this and I'm gonna add this and I'm gonna add this. But I found that a lot of times when I send an email with like a bunch of stuff to people, they get so overwhelmed that they're like, ah, too much i don't know where to go so i really hope you guys don't get overwhelmed and you're going to take this one at a time but that's where you can find way more information on everything that i just shared with you guys today so yes so i'm going to take this document right now and i'm going to send it right here yes there are plant-based meal delivery companies uh i uh plant-based I've never ordered it myself, um, so I don't know at the top of my head. I think Plant Based Nation uh, does it. I know Chef AJ recommends one, so you, maybe if, if you could just Google like Chef AJ, um, you know, Plant Based Meal Delivery Recommendation, and that might pop out. 
Uh, but really, you know, all plant-based delivery ones are okay. Some of them have sodium in it. So you just have to look for that. Um, so depending on what you're interested in, you know, anybody else has any other questions or comments or you guys are silent participants <laughs> comparing to my students. I had, I teach PE and I had, um, you know, 66 kindergartens in a Zoom class. So you can imagine how that goes. Oh, thank you guys. You are very welcome. I really hope that there's something that I said that inspired you somehow. And you know, you don't, you please do not take my word for it. As a matter of fact, I encourage you not to believe everything that I just said and really go and do your own research and look into the doctors and look into those um, presentations and uh, lectures because that's why we got brainwashed because we just saw something and we just like, oh, I'm just going to believe what that person said. And that's why, you know, as when I was pregnant, I was eating a lot more dairy and a lot more protein because I said, this is what I have to do. That's what this little pamphlet says uh, that was coming, who knows from where that, you know, they had an interest of selling different things. So uh, please go and do your own research. You don't have to do what I say, just do what the science says, you know, so look into that and, and um, you know, learn on your own. Yay. People are saying they, love, they learned a lot. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, All right. A well, lot of great information. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure having you guys. And um, yeah.